Randolph Scott, an American actor, was a true Hollywood legend during the Golden Age. Known for his suave charm, rugged masculinity, and distinctive chin, he embodied the ideal tall, dark, and handsome leading man. From 1928 to 1962, Scott graced the silver screen with his presence, captivating audiences in a wide range of genres including dramas, comedies, musicals, adventures, war films, horror flicks, and even fantasy movies. Interestingly, out of his impressive filmography of over 100 appearances, more than 60 of them were westerns. Sadly, he passed away in 1987, leaving behind a secret that had remained hidden until then. Today, let's delve into the life of this iconic Hollywood figure. Scott, born on January 23, 1898, in Orange County, Virginia, grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. He was the second of six children in a family of Scottish descent. His father, George Grant Scott, was the first CPA licensed in North Carolina, born in Franklin, Virginia. His mother, Lucille Crane Scott, hailed from a wealthy North Carolina family, born in Lurie, Virginia. Thanks to his family's wealth, Scott attended private schools like Woodbury Forest School. He showed his athletic prowess early on, excelling in football, baseball, horse racing, and swimming. In April of 1917, the United States joined World War I. By July, Scott had enlisted in a unit of the North Carolina National Guard. He underwent training as an artillery observer and was promoted to corporal in October 1917, then to sergeant in February 1918. Scott began active duty at Fort Monroe, Virginia, with the 2nd Trench Mortar Battalion in May 1918. The battalion was deployed to France in June 1918, where they engaged in combat with the U.S. for Corps in the Taos Sector and Thea Court Zone. Following the armistice on November 11, 1918, the 2nd TM Battalion participated in the post-war occupation of Germany as part of U.S. 6 Corps. After the armistice, Scott attended the Artillery Officer Candidate School in Sorma. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant of field artillery in May 1919 and returned to the United States. Scott arrived in New York City on June 6 and reported to Camp Mills, where he received an honorable discharge on June 13. He utilized his wartime experiences in his acting career, incorporating his horsemanship and firearms training. After concluding his military service, Scott pursued further education at Georgia Tech, during his time there, he joined the Kappa Alpha Order and aspired to excel as an All-American football player. Unfortunately, a back injury hindered him from realizing this ambition. Consequently, Scott decided to transfer to the University of North Carolina, where he focused on studying textile engineering and manufacturing. However, he eventually made the difficult decision to drop out and instead joined the textile firm where his father, a CPA, worked, taking on the role of an accountant. During the late 1920s, George C. Scott embarked on a journey to pursue his passion for acting and made his way to the vibrant city of Los Angeles. Thanks to his father's connection with Howard Hughes, he managed to secure a small role in the film Sharpshooters, 1928. Eager to make his mark in the industry, Scott took on various roles as an extra and bit player in other notable films such as Weary River, 1929, and The Virginian, 1929, starring alongside the talented Gary Cooper. Interestingly, Scott even took on the role of Cooper's dialect coach. Although his contributions went uncredited, Scott's dedication to his craft shone through in films like Dynamite, 1929, and Born Reckless, 1930. Scott's career at Paramount kicked off with a minor role in the comedy Sky Bride, 1932, alongside Richard Arlen and Jack Oakey. However, his big break came when Paramount decided to cast him as the lead in Heritage of the Desert, 1932, marking his debut as a Western hero. Sally Blaine starred opposite him, and Henry Hathaway directed the film. The success of Heritage of the Desert led to Scott starring in 10 B. Western films inspired by Zane Grey's novels. 
Paramount cleverly reused stock footage and even brought back actors like Raymond Hatton and Noah Beery to reprise their roles, despite the noticeable age differences in some scenes. In order to seamlessly match footage from the silent versions, Scott's appearance was altered for films like The Thundering Herd and Man of the Forest in 1933, with darkened hair and a neat moustache reminiscent of Jack Holt, the original star. In the midst of his work on the Zane Grey Western series, Scott took on various non-Western roles at Paramount, including playing The Other Man in Hot Saturday, 1932, alongside Nancy Carroll and Cary Grant. Following his return to Zane Grey Westerns with Wild Horse Messer, 1932, he then starred as the romantic male lead in Hello, Everybody. The Thundering Herd, 1933, was another Zane Grey Western collaboration with Hathaway, before he appeared in two horror films, Murders in the Sioux, 1933, with Lion Latwill and Supernatural, 1933, with Carol Lombard. After his role in the Western Sunset Pass, 1933, Scott was loaned to Columbia by Paramount to portray B.B. Daniels' love interest in the romantic comedy Cocktail Hour, 1933. Upon his return to Paramount, Scott featured in the Western's Man of the Forest, 1933, and To the Last Man, 1933, both adaptations of Zane Grey novels directed by Hathaway and starring Noah Beery Sr. as the antagonist. He was then loaned to Monogram Pictures for Broken Dreams, 1933, before reuniting with Hathaway for The Last Roundup, 1934. Scott went on to make three more Zane Grey Westerns without Hathaway. First up was Wagon Wheels of in 1934, directed by Charles Barton. This film was actually a remake of Fighting Caravans from 1931, which starred the legendary Gary Cooper. Next, in 1935, Scott starred in Home on the Range, directed by Arthur Jacobson. And finally, he appeared in Rocky Mountain Mystery also in 1935, once again directed by Charles Barton. Film historian William K. Everson had high praise for the Zane Grey series, describing them as uniformly good. He even went on to say that To the Last Man was almost a perfect example of its chunra. It had a compelling story about feuding families in the post-Civil War era, a top-notch cast, an excellent direction by Henry Hathaway. Everson also highlighted the memorable climactic fight between the villain, played by Jack LaRue, and the heroine, portrayed by Esther Ralston, who delivered an exceptionally appealing performance. Another standout film in the series was Sunset Pass. Not only was it one of the best, but it also surprised audiences by casting Randolph Scott and Harry Carey as the heavies, or the villains. This departure from their usual heroic roles showcased their versatility as actors. Overall, the Zane Grey series proved to be a valuable experience for Scott, allowing him to hone his skills in both action and acting. It served as an excellent training ground for him, paving the way for his future success in the film industry. RKO lent Scott to star alongside Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, and Irene Dunn in the beloved adaptation of Roberta, 1935. After that, RKO decided to keep him for Village Tale, 1935, and she, 1935, based on H. Ryder Haggard's novel. Scott then made his way back to Paramount for So Read the Rose, 1935, and joined forces with Astaire and Rogers once again in Follow the Fleet, 1936. Paramount saw his success in And Sudden Death, 1936, and The Last of the Mohicans. Following that, Paramount cast him in Go West, Young Man, 1936, and High, Wide, and Handsome, 1937. Scott also had roles in Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, 1938, alongside Shirley Temple and the Texans, 1938, with Joan Bennett. Although he was considered for the part of Ashley Wilkes in Gone with the Wind, Leslie Howard ultimately landed the role. Afterwards, Scott returned to Paramount for So Read the Rose, 1935, alongside Margaret Sullivan. He then reunited with Astaire and Rogers at RKO for Follow the Fleet, 1936, which turned out to be another major hit. Scott also starred in a thrilling card drama at Paramount called and Sudden Death, 
1936, directed by Barton. Later, he was loaned to independent producer Edward Small to portray Hawkeye in the adventure classic, The Last of the Mohicans, based on James Fenimore Cooper's novel. The film was a tremendous success and marked Scott's first major triumph as a leading actor. From that point on, Paramount exclusively cast Scott in A films. He played the love interest of Mae West in Go West, Young Man, 1936, and reunited with Irene Dunn in the musical High, Wide, and Handsome, 1937, directed by Ruben Mamoulian. This particular film showcased Scott's most ambitious performance to date. Scott then ventured to 20th Century Fox to take on the role of the romantic male lead in the Shirley Temple film, Rebecca of Sunnerbrook Farm, 1938. At Paramount, he starred in the well-funded Western, The Texans, 1938, alongside Joan Bennett. He also headlined The Road to Reno, 1938, at Universal. During this time, there was a missed opportunity for Scott. Due to his southern background, he was considered for the role of Ashley Wilkes in Gone with the Wind. However, Leslie Howard ultimately secured the part. After Scott's contract with Paramount came to an end, he inked a new deal with Fox. His first project with them was Jesse James, 1939, a grandiose and highly romanticized tale of the infamous outlaw, Tyrone Power, and his brother Frank, Henry Fonda. Scott played a sympathetic marshal, billed forth after the James brothers, in his first color film. Following this, Scott reunited with Temple in Susanna of the Mounties, 1939, which turned out to be Temple's final successful film for Fox. He then landed the lead role in Frontier Marshal, 1939, as Wyatt Up, before moving on to Columbia for the action-packed Coast Guard, 1939. Returning to Fox, he appeared in the war drama 20,000 Men a Year, 1939. Scott later joined Warner Brothers for Virginia City, 1940, where he played a Confederate officer opposite Errol Flynn and Miriam Hopkins. Despite frequent disagreements over script changes, director Michael Curtis praised Scott for his gentlemanly demeanor and top-notch performance. He then took on the other man role in the hit romantic comedy My Favorite Wife, 1940, for RKO followed by a collaboration with K. Francis in When the Daltons Rode, 1940, at Universal. Back at Fox, Scott starred in Western Union alongside Robert Young, delving back into Zane Grey territory under the direction of Fritz Lang. During World War II, Scott's involvement extended beyond his acting career. After being rejected for an officer's commission in the Marines due to a previous back injury, he found other ways to contribute to the war effort. Alongside Joe Dorita, who would later become a member of the Three Stooges, Scott toured in a comedy act for the Victory Committee showcases. Additionally, he used his ranch to raise food for the government. In terms of his film career, Scott appeared in several war films during this time. He starred in To the Shores of Tripoli at Fox in 1942, Bombardier at RKO in 1943, and Corvette K-225, produced by Howard Hawks and Gung Ho at Universal in 1943. He also had a role in A China Sky at RKO in 1945. Notably, he was part of Columbia Pictures' first Technicolor feature, The Desperados, in 1943, which was produced by Harry Joe Brown, with whom Scott would later form a business partnership. Scott's versatility as an actor was evident as he made appearances in various genres. He made a cameo in Follow the Boys in 1944, alongside other Universal stars. He also starred in the northern film Belle of the Yukon in 1944, opposite Gypsy Rose Lee. Additionally, he had the opportunity to work with Charles Lawton in the swashbuckler film Captain Kidd in 1945, which was a low-budget production by Benedict Bojos. In addition to his film work, Scott showcased his talent on the radio. In 1945, he appeared on two radio shows, Bell of the Yukon on Screen Guild Players and A Lady Takes a Chance for Old Gold Comedy Theatre. 
Scott's dedication to his craft and his contributions to the war effort during this time period exemplify his commitment and versatility as an entertainer. In 1946, Scott stepped into the spotlight with Abilene Town, a UA release that showcased him as a fearless lawman, determined to bring justice to a lawless town. This film solidified his status as a cowboy hero, propelling him into a string of westerns that would dominate his career. Each of these late 1940s westerns had a budget of around 1 million US dollars, which would be equivalent to $15,600,000 in today's currency. Scott collaborated mostly with producers Nat Holt and Harry Joe Brown at Warner Brothers, although he did venture out to Paramount for Albuquerque, 1948. According to the BFI companion to the Western, Scott's earlier Westerns portrayed him as debonair, easygoing, and graceful, with a touch of steel. However, as he aged into his 50s, his roles underwent a transformation. Scott became the embodiment of a man who had experienced it all, pain, loss, and hardship. Yet, he had attained a stoic calmness that shielded him from the unpredictable nature of life. While westerns dominated Scott's filmography, he did venture into other genres. He starred in a mystery film called Home Sweet Homicide, 1947, alongside Peggy and Garner at Fox, and also took on a family drama titled Christmas Eve, 1947, for Bojo's. Additionally, he made a cameo appearance in Warner Starlift, 1951. Scott collaborated with producer Nat Holt on a series of Western films, starting with Badman's Territory and Trail Street at Arkeo. They continued their partnership with Return of the Bad Men and Canadian Pacific at Arkeo, followed by Fighting Man of the Plains and the Caribou Trail at Fox. In 1955, Scott worked with Holt again on Rage at Dawn, a film released by Arkeo. Later, Scott reunited with producer Harry Joe Brown at Columbia for Gunfighters and went on to create a string of westerns together, including Coroner Creek and The Walking Hills. Moving on to Warner Brothers, Scott starred in Cold Point for Five and continued to work on various projects such as Sugarfoot and Fort Worth. His collaboration with Brown and other studios resulted in a diverse range of Western films that showcased Scott's talent in the genre. In 1955, screenwriter Bert Kennedy wrote the script for Seven Men From Now, intended to be filmed by Bat Jack Productions with John Wayne as the lead and Bud Boticher as the director. However, Wayne's commitment to the searchers led him to suggest Scott as his replacement. The resulting film, released in 1956, is now considered one of Scott's finest works, marking the beginning of a successful collaboration between Scott and Boticher on seven films. Each film in this collection, known as the Ranone Cycle, stands on its own with no shared characters or settings. Boticher's films are known for their beauty, precise structure, and visual elegance, particularly in their use of the stunning California Sierra's landscape. Scott's collaboration with Boticher added a touch of quiet humor to the innately pessimistic tone of the films, with Scott facing off against charming villains like Richard Boone and Claude Akins. The unofficial series continued with Buchanan Rides Alone, and the last two films, Ride Lonesome and Comanche Station, both written by Kennedy, concluded the cycle. In 1962, Scott made his final film appearance in Ride the High Country, directed by Sam Peckinpah and co-starring Joel McRae. The film captures the essence of the Old West, exploring the emotional bonds between men and the contrast between youth and age. While McRae's role is slightly larger, Scott received top billing in a coin flip decision by the director, adding an interesting twist to their on-screen dynamic. Ride the High Country showcases the talent and legacy of both Scott and McRae, leaving a lasting impression on audiences. After retiring from film, Scott, a wealthy man, lived in Beverly Hills with his wife Patricia. He remained friends with Fred Astaire and attended Dodgers games. An avid golfer, he was a member of various country clubs and owned a golf course in Corona, California. He also had a deep religious faith and was an active member of Episcopal churches in Beverly Hills and Charlotte, North Carolina. Randolph Scott's love life was quite eventful as he walked down the aisle twice. 
His first marriage was in 1936 to Marion Dupont, an heiress with an impressive lineage. Marion, the daughter of William Dupont Sr. and the great-granddaughter of Eleuthery Iron E. Dupont de Nemers, founder of E. I. Dupont de Nemers and Company, had previously tied the knot with George Somerville, with Scott standing by her side as the best man. Unfortunately, their marriage ended in divorce after three years, and they did not have any children together. However, Marion chose to keep Scott's last name for nearly five decades until her passing in 1983. Moving forward to 1944, Scott found love once again and married the talented actress Patricia Stillman. Despite their significant age difference, with Patricia being 21 years younger, their bond was strong. In 1950, they expanded their family by adopting two children, Sandra and Christopher, bringing joy and love into their lives. Scott, despite his fame as a movie star, managed to maintain a low-key personal life. After he passed away, the world discovered something that left everyone astonished, Scott's hidden romance with Cary Grant came to light. Behind the scenes, he formed a strong bond with fellow actors Fred Astaire and Cary Grant. It all began when he crossed paths with Grant on the set of Hot Saturday, 1932. Soon after, they decided to become roommates and settled into a charming beach house in Malibu, which they affectionately called Bachelor Hall. There were whispers of a romantic relationship between the two, but both men, along with their wives and families, vehemently denied these rumors time and time again. Interestingly, Richard Blackwell, an actor at RKO, and photographer Jerome Zerby, who captured intimate moments of the pair in their home, claimed to have had intimate encounters with them. In fact, Blackwell even wrote in his autobiography that Grant and Scott were deeply and passionately in love, their commitment unwavering. Eventually, in 1944, Scott and Grant decided to part ways as roommates, but their friendship endured for the rest of their lives. Scott passed away in 1987 at the age of 89 due to heart and lung issues in Beverly Hills, California. He was laid to rest at Elmwood Cemetery in Charlotte, North Carolina. He had been married to his wife Patricia for 43 years. After her death in 2004, she was buried beside him. Unfortunately, their mid-century modern home was demolished in 2008. The Uckla Library Special Collections received the Randolph Scott Papers, which contained various items such as photos, scrapbooks, notes, letters, articles, and house plans. Randolph Scott was not only a legendary figure in the realm of Western cinema but also a gentleman whose on-screen presence exuded integrity, courage, and strength. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you for watching to support our channel please subscribe.